Good evening. I'm Bill Doley. I'm the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, a nonprofit organization based here in Tucson. And <clears throat> tonight's talk, which is going to focus on the early agricultural period, and Tucson has really been at the forefront of that new research. And tonight, uh, Jim Watson, uh, Dr. James T. Watson, uh, the associate director of the Arizona State Museum, has been working extensively extensively in uh, northern Mexico, uh, the site of La Playa that you'll, you'll see uh, tonight, doing bioanthropology, so looking at uh, the <clears throat> human remains that are uh, preserved in the archaeological record and gaining new insights in, in, uh, into things that are actually hard to see uh, often in the archaeological record, which are issues related to violence and uh, sort of the hard times uh, that people may have experienced in the past. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And we all look really forward to uh, your presentation. And we are, for the very first time, live streaming this on Facebook. So uh, there, we hope at the end there will be opportunities to uh, ask questions here in the audience and uh, even some of our Facebook observers may be able to ask questions. So we'll be back with questions uh, after Jim's presentation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Bill. Hopefully both of them will have questions. Uh, well, I guess I can skip ahead because Bill uh, gave half my talk already. <laughs> when corn arrives, what do I do? Uh, no, no, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. I, I, this is a great program uh, I've done one before uh, in its uh, initial iteration at uh, Casa Vicente, but this is terrific. And this is uh, its a great place. You guys relax and can drink beer and eat popcorn. Uh, hopefully you don't choke on any of that popcorn while I'm discussing violent acts, but <clears throat> we'll see. I'm sure you're all strong patrons here. All right. Well, uh, before I get started, uh, Bill's right. I've working, been working in northern Mexico for 20 years this year. I've uh, been working on the project of La Playa, which we'll hear mostly about. But one of the things I want to talk about is that there is most of what we've been seeing at La Playa have also almost directly connected to, or at least if we see mirror examples of this here in the Tucson Basin and in other parts of the Sonoran Desert. Uh, and so the theme of this year's uh, uh, Archaeology Cafe is this interconnectedness and interconnectivity. And that's one of the things that we can see is across a very vast expanse of land, we see a lot of connections. And so we'll talk about some of that tonight. But first, before we get started into the violence, I'm sure what everyone came to, to hear about, um, actually, my title was really just designed to get you here. I'm not going to talk about violence at all. I'm going to talk about myself, because that's what I do best. So I am a bioarchaeologist. In addition to uh, my daytime TV role as associate director of the State Museum, I'm also a curator of bioarchaeology. And most people say, what the hell is bioarchaeology? Uh, well, it's the uh, unfortunate stepchild of two of the subdisciplines of anthropology, archaeology and biological anthropology. Archaeology is obviously concerned with the material past and reconstructing human behavior in that past, and biological anthropology is concerned with our evolution as a species, the variability or variation in that species, and then, of course, our distant and close relatives, including primates and fossil hominins. So when you mash all that together, you get a bioarchaeologist. Uh, the unfortunate thing about being a bioarchaeologist is both of those other subdisciplines don't get you at all. Uh, the bioanthropologists say, oh, well, you're an archaeologist. You wouldn't get this. Uh, and the bioanthropologists bio say, oh, well, you're you know, uh, an archaeologist. You wouldn't get this. So uh, we live in this limbo, but it's a critical limbo because one of my biggest arguments for why bioarchaeology is important is because we study human remains, as opposed to most other archaeologists who study the materials left behind by humans and human behavior. We actually study the people themselves, the people that made those artifacts, that built those buildings, that enacted that behavior. And so there's a lot that can be reconstructed from the remains themselves. And that's why it's critical. So uh, just as sort of background, uh, Bioarchaeology, in its very basal definition, is the study of human remains from archaeological context. Uh, 
And what's important about that is that the baseline is an osteological approach. So the human, uh, the skeletal tissue that's preserved in archaeological sites and what we can glean from that. Uh, and then, of course, what's also critical is the, context, the context in which those remains are found. And these are generally often referred to as mortuary context or mortuary analysis. Um, for the most part, the osteological approach that we use as bioarchaeologists is identical to that of forensic anthropologists. So if any of you watch the show Bones or other ridiculous TV like that that's horribly inaccurate. Um, this is, we, we do the same sort of thing. We use the skeletal system to reconstruct the basics of a biological identity of an individual or the biological parameters of an individual to be able to try and reconstruct identity. Uh, the difference is, is that in the case of forensic anthropologists, they're trying to identify the remains of one individual to missing persons. Or in the case of for example, war crimes, multiple individuals to groups of people that have gone missing. In the case of bioarchaeologists, we're much more interested in a population approach. And so it's less about the individual and more about what we can glean about the population in the past and how things changed over time. So, on to violence. I was joking, we are going to talk about violence. I think the most important thing to understand is that uh, the myth, hopefully, of the noble savage has long gone. And that sort of utopian view is no longer a realistic vision of not just peoples in the past, but peoples in general, to the point where I think some anthropologists and economists and, and uh, other uh, people in general might argue that humans are inherently violent. The archaeological record and the idea of researching violence into the past is to give a deep time perspective to the nature of violence and perhaps look for patterns in human behavior that either contribute to violence or perhaps uh, can be used to demonstrate how violence can be controlled. And so that's why it's important to look at these subjects in the past. Forgive me, this is my third lecture today, so I'm starting to run out of steam and spit. Uh, but you're an exciting audience, so I'll be 100% engaged. So it's, first and foremost, it's important to understand that violence is common among human societies throughout all space and time. However, it fluctuates by space and time, and that's part of the nature of, the arche of archaeological research, is that you're looking for instances where perhaps violence is more common, uh, violence is less common, and the circumstances under which those uh, behaviors are enacted. The same, of course, is true in the North American Desert West in the region that we're currently situated. Violence is and has been documented throughout a good portion of the southwestern United States. Largely, however, focused on places like the Colorado Plateau, the Four Corners area, what we often refer to in a much broader sense as the ancestral Puebloan areas. And so, of course, that includes everywhere from southern Utah and Colorado down into northern Mexico and Chihuahua. Um, but these areas have a long history of documented evidence for violence. However, it's also a cyclical pattern of violence, and things change over time. Um, although a little bit dated now, uh, I really like a book that was written by Steve LeBlanc in 1999 uh, called Prehistoric Warfare in the American Southwest. And he tries to define three periods of, of cyclical violence. The earliest is that very early period where early villages start and corn farming begins, um, and that's about from 0 to 900 A.D., and he says it's really about those stresses of trying to perform agriculture up on the high plateau area, and that that causes violence. Resource stress causes people to become violent and actively war against each other. Then you have this period in the middle, uh, which is really defined from, from 900 to 1150, which is really defined by the rise and influence of Chaco, Chaco Canyon, for those of you that are familiar with it, had developed this sphere of influence that appears to, to some archaeologists, in fact, Steve Lexon refers to this time period as the Pax Chaco, the time period of peace in that region of the Southwest, uh, in which he argues that the central political authority probably controlled that warfare that was going on prior to this period. However, it's during that time that you see what would effectively be goon squads running around the Puebloan world enacting well, I wouldn't call it justice, but enacting the political authority of that central political uh, system. Um, and this is where you get cases of cannibalism, for example, 
Uh, and this is the cover of uh, Christy and Jacqueline Turner's book, Mancorn, which documents several dozen cases that they argue are cases of cannibalism in the prehistoric Southwest. And almost all of these are within that ancestral Puebloan world. Um, I would argue, and many scholars have, that not all of these cases are true, but there probably have been definitive examples of cannibalism in the prehistoric Southwest, which, of course, caused a great deal of controversy and unrest, not just in the discipline, but especially amongst many Native American communities, um, considering these sorts of woeful behaviors in the past. But that's the reality of the archaeological evidence as well, which is another issue when it comes to dealing with... I oh, was that blocking my good side? Okay. We don't want to cheat the Facebook people. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and then the, the last period is, that uh, LeBlanc describes is the late period, which is 1250 to, 40, to 1540. And he describes this as large communities coming together and then eventually large-scale warfare that causes these communities to fall apart and there's, there's integration or, or resettlement re into what are now the historic or modern pueblos in the northern Rio Grande, Hopi, Acoma, Zuni, places like that. So for the most part, most of the evidence that's been documented for violence in the prehistoric Southwest has focused in this plateau area. And, oddly, the area in which we are located, in the Sonoran Desert, has scant to very little evidence for violence. Some people argue that perhaps burning of villages or, uh, is evidence of violence in some cases. Um, in the ancestral, what we consider the ancestral Hohokam world, that area in southern Arizona from the Salt and, and Gila River Basin south, um, that there's really very little evidence skeletally to suggest that violence occurred and nothing like we see up on the plateau. So there's a very stark contrast. Until recently, and this has to do with not just my work but the work of um, actually several projects by Desert Archaeology uh, and, and other researchers in the area have discovered more and more evidence of violence, but a very restricted time period, and that's the beginning of the cultural sequence in the Sonoran Desert. When does that start, you may ask? Great question. It starts, as Bill said, somewhere around 4,000 years ago when corn or maize comes into the area. Now, corn is really an amazing plant. Pause for laughter. <clears throat> it is highly adaptable, and so maize is domesticated in Mesoamerica, and it moves into the southwest. And it appears almost simultaneously across the entire region. We have good archaeological evidence and similar dates from the Tucson Basin up through uh, eastern and central New Mexico, up into northern Arizona and northern New Mexico. So corn comes into the region, and then it spreads like wildfire immediately. And the period that we're talking about here in the Sonoran Desert is referred to as the early agricultural period. It spans almost 2,000 years as people settle into permanent villages and start farming corn. However, despite the fact that corn is introduced into the southwest and then spreads like wildfire, it is really only invested in to any great degree in the Sonoran Desert, in the southern southwest. People up on the plateau up until about 500 B.C. or so are just, maybe they're munching on corn, uh, they think it's a cool plant, they planted it here and there, uh, but it really doesn't have the same effect. And dry farming, which is really the major limitation up on the Colorado Plateau, isn't ideal in this case uh, until people really start to decide to put the effort in to, to farm. In the Sonoran Desert, however, people start investing in corn right away. And I'm going to tell you how we know that in a minute. Um, just real quick, this is a, a map of outline of the Sonoran Desert, so it encompasses the Phoenix Basin, Tucson Basin, and then down here through much of... Um, central and western Sonora. And then the site that I'll be talking about is La Playa, which is just about uh, 150 miles due south of Tucson. And like I said at the beginning, the site of La Playa and the sites that have been excavated in the Tucson Basin and a little bit to the east of the basin uh, have very similar characteristics. And so we'll talk about that. So why is it the Sonoran Desert people invest in corn here? Well, they independently invent, as Bill mentioned, about uh, 3,500 years ago, irrigation technology. This is something that is almost nearly contemporaneous in Mesoamerica, irrigation technology, but it's very different. And this is a definitively indigenous adaptation that is developed in the direct response 
to the productivity of corn, of maize. Now, one thing, actually, I should bring it back one to point out, or two, to point out what maize was like at the time. These, this is characteristic of the size of the cobs of maize. So it's not the state farm corn that you think of or state fair corn that you think of when you go to um, the state fair, uh, but it's tiny, tiny cobs. And realistically, you'd need a lot of these to feed the same number of people that we would use a, a much less corn to feed today. So uh, just to sort of put things in perspective. So irrigation is a critical step in the increased productivity of maize in the southwest, and particularly in the southern southwest. And this type of irrigation could not have been reproduced or even produced independently up on the Colorado Plateau. Again, physiographic differences were huge in this sense. Uh, and that continues to be the case. There's small-scale irrigation, but nothing to this scale in the northern southwest. So this is an example, and this comes from uh, uh, an issue of Archaeology Southwest that I was told is actually out of print, but you can download the PDF online. So make sure to get one of those um, little paper things they had out front if you're interested. Uh, and this is Jim Vint. He's about 6'1", 6'2". So this is a big guy strolling across this landscape. And this is a surface, a large surface that was exposed uh, of a prehistoric archaeological site, of an early agricultural period site that shows the layout of the field system. And this is just a schematic. So what you see here is a primary canal that would have come off of a river, uh, the Santa Cruz, for example. So this is located at the site of Las Capas, which is located at uh, I-10 and Ina, uh, for those of you from Tucson. It's right now under the Miranda Wastewater uh, Treatment Plant. So I will say it definitely it stinks to work here, <laughs> especially in the summer. Uh, but you can appreciate the scale because of Jim strolling through the site while they were taking this photo. So the primary canal comes off, and you have these lateral canals that eventually feed what's referred to as a waffle grid system or, or, or a waffle garden. And these are just bermed up fields that are designed to retain that moisture. Uh, and several of these have been found along the Santa Cruz River at several sites. And then most recently, the uh, expansion of uh, one of the exits or the road of a uh, sunset road, they've identified in one of these fields that they peeled back footprints. And this is a picture of one of those footprints that they identified. Footprints not only of adults walking across the field when it was obviously muddy and then got covered with a, a floodwaters and sand, but children and dogs. So this is what makes archaeology really engaging is when you can actually see and literally put your feet and hands into the, the behaviors of the past and people's uh, well, literally walk in their footprints. I don't want to get too romantic. I'm going to get misty. <clears throat> Let's get back to irrigation. Blood flowed like water. That was the metaphor. Irrigation is the flowing of the water. Uh, so these irrigation systems obviously have a big effect on, on maize productivity and differ significantly in the size and the scale of villages in this time period versus contemporaneous villages up on the Colorado Plateau. However, this also, and several archaeologists have argued, causes some problems in which that everybody needs to invest in the first production, the building of these extensive canal systems, and the, to the maintenance of them. Because, you know, every time the river floods, you've got to dig it all back out again. And in fact, at several sites, we have successive a palimpsest of canal systems, one right on top of the other, as they didn't exactly dig out the old systems. They built new ones in the current floodplain. And so as a result, we get a really complex uh, stratigraphic sort of orientation to these, to these canal systems. So everybody has to invest in building these. These are small communities. Let's say 50 people to max 100 or so. So these are relatively small communities. So everybody's got to invest in the success of the community when it comes to building these canal systems. However, there is some archaeological evidence to suggest that at this time, we're also seeing a transition to concepts of private property. Not Maybe perhaps not what we think of today uh, in that you'd shoot anyone that steps on your land. But instead, although you built those canals the fields and the yields that you're responsible for, well, the fields that you're responsible for growing your corn in, those are what produce what your family will feed off of for the coming year. And so there is a personal investment here, or at least an investment for the family group that you're concerned with. And so this creates this potential social tension between community interests and personal interests. 
Um, and one of the places that we can see that is in the bioarchaeological record, looking at mortuary context and how mortuary ritual may not actually ease those tensions, but instead reflect how people were trying to actively mitigate those tensions. And so, for example, one of those ways is observed in how people place their dead in the ground and what they placed with their dead, uh, with their loved ones. So one of the things we see is, unlike many other time periods throughout not just the Southwest but throughout the world, we see a great variability to how people were placed in the ground. You know, nowadays our options are, well, cremation or burial, right? And if you choose to get buried in the flesh, often you're put in a coffin. So you're in an extended position. Most of the time, hopefully, you're the coroner or the you know, mortician puts you on your back instead of on your face. Um, so there, there's a lot of regularity to body positioning in modern society. Uh, or you're put in an urn and distributed across parts of the landscape. In the past, however, we have a lot of variability to, and particularly during this early agricultural period, we have a lot of variability in how people place their dead in the ground. And so these are just a few examples. Um, flexed individuals can see in various uh, positions here, extended individuals, and pretty much everything in between. So this really talks to, this really speaks to how the loved ones are putting their individual that have passed away into the ground. And the fact that there's so much variability means that there's no larger cultural prescription for how the body should be treated or placed in the ground, like we do today for the most part. Grave goods or funerary objects are one of the places where we can often, and archaeologists like to look for evidence of social stratification because people that are rich often like to get buried. Well, in our case, they'd be buried in a mausoleum or a really opulent coffin, uh, maybe with a juice bar in your coffin. I don't know. Uh, but in, the, in this case, in the past, in archaeological cases of, of social stratification, the richest burials are those that have the most stuff. And there's a lot of interpretations we can build from that, but what's probably most important about it is that there is a definite identification of wealth differential between the haves and the have-nots. And, I mean, you can think of uh, famous examples like the Lord of Sipan or um, the first dynastic emperor of China and all of the terracotta soldiers and all the riches that he was buried with, uh, or King Tut. I mean, all of these are classic examples of the rich taking everything with them, or at least a good portion of what they had with them. Not the case in this society. Very few individuals are buried with any sort of funerary objects. Less than, or about 10% of the samples that we have, both in Mexico and in southern Arizona, have any kind of object left with the body. And generally, these objects reflect either gender-specific roles or some sort of special identity for that individual. So, for example, uh, items like this, which is this is a stone pipe with a bone stem, uh, were placed with males in several cases. Uh, one male, we made the argument in Mexico at the site of La Playa that uh, he was buried with a pipe similar to this under his chin and a couple of shell um, uh, pendants. And we'd argued that this individual perhaps was a shaman. And they use this, which is often referred to as a cloud blower, smoke, uh, cloud blower pipe uh, to sort of for shamanistic rituals. So that individual identity would have been important. And then in other cases, things like grinding stones, uh, bone pins would have been placed with particular individuals based on, and projectile points with males. Uh, in these cases, bone pins and, and grinding stones often with, with women. So there seems to be gendered identity folded into these objects being placed with these individuals. But again, it's only a few of the individuals within these cemeteries or across these skeletal samples or these societies. And so what this means is that they're not designating individuals as being of a different social rank or particularly special. And so this may, again, indicate that they're trying to downplay individuality and, and play up community membership. So um, if those tensions are being mitigated in other ways, then why would violence occur during this time period? The other thing that I should mention, sorry, let me go back. I'm showing you my whole slideshow. Sorry. The other thing that I should mention is that during this time period, there's very little evidence for resource limitations or stress related to resources. Um, we're talking about uh, mixed subsistence economies. So, of course, 
The Sonoran Desert is an extremely rich environment, biotically speaking. You've got dozens of plant species and, of course, animals uh, that you can consume. And some of the great, what I like to refer to the Sonoran Desert as a cactus copia. There's so much great stuff that you can consume here. There's cactus fruits and pads and mesquite pods and agave. Uh, there's all kinds of, there's, you know, wild grasses. There's all kinds of stuff that you can consume without having to rely on agriculture. So when agriculture comes in, it just gets added to the mix. And at no point throughout the historic or prehistoric uh, sequence do the native communities in the Sonoran Desert stop consuming wild resources. That never happens. Um, instead, in some cases, they actually ramp up the production of some of these, like, for example, agave. Uh, and then, of course, today you can go out and buy uh, choya buds and, and mesquite flour to consume. So the Sonoran Desert is, is an ideal place. So this mixed subsistence economy, you add corn and then eventually beans and squash to the mix, and you've got the foundation of a UNESCO designation as a world city of gastronomy. <laughs> and truthfully, this is part of that equation. It was the city archaeologist who put that designation in based on the fact that the foundation of the gastrono gastronomic variability in, or variability in gastronomy uh, within Tucson and southern Arizona in general, its foundations are, one, in the desert that go back thousands of years, but two, it starts to ramp up with the introduction of maize and beans and squash, and then you get European influences, the Spanish arrive, they add things to the mix. So what we're really looking at is a huge variety, and that's what contributes to that designation. And it goes back minimally 4,000 years, if not, I would argue, more as people were grocery shopping at this cactus copia. So what this means biologically is that, the, based on the skeletal remains that we have, people were extremely healthy at this time. They lived to be very old in you know, a prehistoric sense, let's say 50 or 60, and then uh, they didn't have much in the way of evidence of nutritional deficiencies or growth disruptions. So these are relatively healthy populations. So why would they... So all this suggests that there's no reason for conflict to occur, but we do have evidence that it does occur. So there's a couple of forms of evidence, and the first thing that we'll, that we'll consider are the bones themselves. And like I said, this is where behavior interacts with biology. And uh, when someone behaves badly and hits you on the head with a mace, your biology suffers. Uh, in some cases, you die. And that's what we're looking at here. And so... Um, like I said, you can apply this in the Tucson Basin as well. I've looked at this in other skeletal samples that we've recovered from the Tucson Basin. But here in the sample of La Playa, um, we've got over 350, the remains of over 350 individuals, but we focused on a smaller sample that is best preserved um, so that we can be sure that we're not missing skeletal lesions in, in the process. And over half of those individuals have some form of trauma. Now, I'm hesitant or I'm... I'm in, I impress upon you that there's a difference between trauma and violence. Trauma is simply lesions on the bone that we can determine were caused by some sort of traumatic injury. However, violent trauma is a very specific type of trauma. And that has, by saying that it's violent trauma, means you're imbuing it with some sort of behavioral quality. And that means that there's malintent behind it. And so, of course, in foraging communities, even in farming communities, people, there's accidents all the time. Uh, you know, there's even hunting accidents. Look at Dick Cheney. It's a little dated reference, but I, I imagine most people in the crowd get it. So, um, <clears throat> so these things have certainly could have happened in the past, and they did. People fell off of rocks, climb an opinion tree to gather some nuts. Uh, you know, you fall down and hit your head, whatever the case. Um, so we were careful to separate out what was trauma from what was violent trauma. And what we were able to see is that that still produces a large percentage of the sample of individuals who were affected by trauma. Now, it doesn't mean that all these individuals died from trauma. In fact, we'll see in a, in a minute that wasn't the case. But if you think about this percentage, almost 33% of the sample that we looked at suffered some sort of violence. If we put that in a scale of modern society and we think about World War II as being the costliest, deadliest war in history, Somewhere along the lines of 60 million people died as a result of that conflict. But when you scale it to the population of the world at that time, in 1940, let's say, it only ends up being about 3% mortality. 
So 3% mortality during World War II versus, now again, this isn't mortality, but I'm just trying to show the scale of violence. In these small-scale societies, if 33% of individuals suffer from some sort of violence, there's some major problems going on during this time period. And that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. What's interesting about those people that have suffered violence, this graph shows you uh, trauma versus violent trauma. And so this is the distribution of evidence of trauma. And then it's also specifically called out which are those that we designate as violent trauma. You can see that it spans most age categories. So from juveniles, from as young as 12, up to the older age categories, or senescence as we like to call it. That's really an offensive word. Uh, as I approach senescence. Um, <clears throat> but you can see not only does it cross all age categories, so everybody in the community has the potential to suffer trauma and violent trauma, it is relatively equal between males and females within these communities as well. So both males and females and children and adults all experienced violence and in many cases suffered violent trauma from this. That's another caveat that I want to throw in here, which is one of the limitations of working with skeletal remains is that we don't have the soft tissue. The skeletal tissue preserves only what has impacted it. And so as a result, I guarantee that a lot more people died or were impacted by trauma, and violent trauma in particular, but that doesn't show up in the skeletal record. So this 33% is actually lower, probably, than it should be based on what would, have so what would soft tissue Soft tissue would tell us. There's a lot, plenty of people today that get shot in the gut and there's no effect to the bone and they die from it or you know, they certainly suffer violent trauma in that case. So it's interesting to look at the distribution. Both males and females, adults and children are all affected by trauma in these early agricultural communities. Now, the trauma that we've documented in this sample is, has been identified across the entire skeleton. So you see it from the head to the toes, basically. In fact, one of the most common... Oops, wrong one. One of the most common injuries that we see are broken toes. These people stub their toes a lot. You know, you're walking around without sandals, you, stub, you kick a rock. It's a desert. What do you expect? So there's a lot of broken toes. So that's not quite violent trauma uh, unless you really kick that rock violently. But that's a whole other issue. Uh, so you can see there's trauma all across the entire skeleton from the head to the toes. And the problem is that most of this trauma is actually nonviolent, because most of the postcranial skeletal trauma, which is about 60% of this, the, the trauma present in the sample, is nonviolent postcranial. It's you fall, you break an arm. The one exception that we can say that was definitively or most likely violent trauma in the postcranial skeleton, so everything except the cranium, were what we refer to as perifractures as you try to deflect a blow, as someone's trying to hit you in the head, and you put your arm up, and the blow instead is absorbed by your ulna, your arm bone, and that fractures as a result. And we have numerous cases of perifractures in this sample as well. So these people were not only getting bashed on the head, they were also trying to protect their head from getting bashed, and that suff they suffered for it. So there's trauma all over the place, but most of the violent trauma, with the exception of that, that one exception, uh, the perifractures, occurs in the cranium. And there's a couple of reasons for this. And that is, in most cases, when people try to enact violence on another individual, they go for the head. That's where, for the most part, our, especially the face, that's where our identity, our communication emanates from. And so, in many cases, they try and destroy that. Or, they know that a solid blow to the head, especially the back of the head, will knock you out, either killing you or at least rendering you unconscious. So as a result, most violent trauma that we find in this sample is associated with the cranium. And one of the things that you can see is the patterning of this trauma tells us something about the behavior, behavior as well. First of all, um, you can note that red is coded for male, blue for female. Um, both of these, males and females, like I said, both su have suffered trauma at the same degree same proportion, you can see they also suffered it across the entire cranium as well. This becomes important because different types of trauma or different types of violence, I should say, can cause different patterns in the trauma on the skull in particular. Um, so that's what we'll look at next.
I want to draw your attention to this table here. This is the sample in the distribution, and so uh, we didn't see many individuals of the younger age categories with evidence for violence or trauma, but there's also potential issues with preservation. Um, the younger the bone, the less likely it is to preserve evidence of trauma as well. So most of the sample we're dealing here with is adult, as I said, except for that, uh, that uh, adolescent category, effectively. But what I want to bring your attention to here is the violent trauma identified in the sample. So this is pulling out the violent trauma from the nonviolent trauma. And again, those definitive, or at least we could argue more definitive examples of violence. Um, and so you see some very interesting patterns here. First of all, BFT, blunt force trauma, being smashed with something, versus sharp force trauma. Um, and in this case, of course, we're mostly talking about stone tools. Uh, and what we see here is that, again, both males and females suffer that blunt force trauma, both, and of course, these represent those perifractures. Um, males and females both exhibit that same blunt force trauma in equal proportions, relatively. Um, and antemortem means that it's healed. And so you can see here an example of this uh, drawing that shows that this individual has been smashed in the head, but the cracks aren't as visible because the bone has started to heal over. And so that's how we know whether the individual lived past that injury. And this is also important because in many cases, these individuals also have multiple cases of blunt force trauma on the cranium. So they weren't just smashed in the head once, but they were smashed in the head multiple times, which again gets at what's going on with behavior there or has a potential to. So again, males and females both exhibit relatively even amounts of blunt force trauma before they die, which meaning it gets healed and they come back for more, or at least they get to experience more. Uh, sharp force trauma, there's a few cases, and again, both males and females experience sharp force trauma. Uh, in males, these tend to be um, uh, projectile points embedded in the body, so you get shot, and then you continue to live. We had one case where a guy was shot in the back of a head with a projectile point, and uh, the tip was broken off and left in there, and it healed, the bone began to heal around it. That was one tough dude. Can you picture that? You get shot in the back of the head, you turn around, you snap it off, you give the guy a stare. That's pretty badass. And then you live another couple of years before something else does you in. Probably arthritis. <clears throat> uh, and then in these cases, these are interesting because the two females that experienced sharp force trauma were cuts to the face. So these women were cut in the face that was so deep that it went through the skin and into the bone, and then it began to heal afterwards. And there's no evidence that those injuries resulted in the death of the individual. They began to heal or they were healed. Um, so again, something probably not in this case blunt or uh, you know, projectile points or arrows being shot or darts in this case at this time period in these individuals, but uh, these, they were cut by something and likely stone tools. Um, <clears throat> so there's something to be said for uh, these individuals and their interaction in this sphere of violence. Then the other part of it, which is important, and again, the proportion of antemortem to perimortem, perimortem is at the time of death. So these are traumatic injuries that could have resulted in the death of the individual, and there's no evidence for healing on them. And so in this case, you can see this is an example of perimortem trauma that there's no evidence for healing. Nice clean breaks uh, around the, or nice clean lines around the breaks, the fracture uh, is still intact. There's no evidence of healing like you see here. So this individual died at or shortly after the impact. The trauma was inflicted on this individual. And you can see in this case, we have a disproportionate relationship. Males have blunt force cranial trauma. So these are individuals who likely died from being bashed in the head. And again, no females. And then same thing, sharp force trauma. These are males that were impacted with something. And in both of these cases, they were shot with projectile points. Um, these cases that I excavated, one was shot in the back of the neck, severed the spinal column, uh, and the other one was shot between the ribs in the back. Um, so these are cases where these individuals definitely died from injuries likely related to being attacked. And I will say again, these aren't the only cases. There are several cases from uh, the Tucson Basin where males were shot several times uh, and, and probably likely died as a result of them, and we recover the projectile points embedded in the bodies. 
Um, so this is one of the things we can say is that what's interesting is that most people lived through their injuries. Very few actually died from them. And again, there's both males and females in this situation. There's the second piece of evidence that I talked about. The first was the skeletal evidence. The second is the contextual evidence. And elsewhere I've argued that these are atypical burials. These are burials or individuals who are interred in non-traditional mortuary terms. So we talked about at the beginning, there's a lot of variability in how people were placed during this time period, and it probably reflects that relationship of the family treating the body of the loved one who's deceased. So that produces this variability. In this case, these individuals are placed in what are apparently irreverent positions, including this is sort of a cross-section of a burial in which these individuals, two separate individuals, are placed head into a pit. In fact, this one, the way we found it was that two bones were sticking out of the ground. They were leg bones. And we started excavating down further and further and further and further and eventually realized this individual was dumped in a very deep pit and was almost completely vertical. Um, this individual was buried in a position that nobody should ever try. I don't care how good you are at yoga. Uh, the neck was broken as a result of fitting this position, this individual, into this pit. Um, this individual, this is a woman, and she was laid out in a sprawled or prone position, so face down. And what's not in this drawing is an infant that's located just above or just in front of her left arm or hand. Um, no evidence for trauma, but this was also a poorly preserved burial. The infant really, uh, we, didn't, we didn't, there was really traces of an infant, not the full skeleton. So that was a little tough to tell. But again, in this case, this you could sort of picture somebody running away from an attack, being killed and sort of falling in place. I've seen it in a movie. <laughs> and then this one, the most interesting recent work by one of my graduate students pointed this out. This individual is a child between 10 and 12 years of age, and it appears that this individual was buried with hands tied behind the back, perhaps to the ankles as well. So there's something going on here, again, behaviorally, that indicates that violence is pervasive during this time period. So the combination of clear evidence for violence on the skeleton and then the contextual information. And I will mention that several of these individuals also display evidence of skeletal trauma as well. In fact, two of these, um, they had the embedded projectile points, so they were killed and then dumped in precarious positions. Um, uh, these individuals had post-mortem breaks on their body, uh, which indicated that they weren't just simply killed and dumped in a pit, but perhaps jumped on or other things were broken before they were dumped in the pit. Uh, at or around the time of death. So uh, pretty bad stuff on any scale. So what can we tell from this? How can we interpret this evidence for, for trauma in the past and violence in particular? Well, first, not all trauma, obviously, is the result of violence. That's the first thing. So we had to separate out violent trauma from nonviolent trauma. That's critical to reconstructing behavior in the past. Secondly, not all trauma, in fact, most of the violent trauma that we observed resulted in death of the individual. Very few cases where the trauma resulted in the death of the individual. So most people lived through their traumatic experience, their violent trauma, and then lived on to, uh, to continue and possibly even experience more trauma later on. And then, in addition, not all violent death resulted in these deviant bur or these atypical burials. And we know that because we have several individuals, like I described here in the Tucson Basin, where these individuals were killed by things like projectile points, being shot numerous times, and then buried in the same way that you would bury your loved one, the same mortuary rituals that you see associated with the other individuals that I described closer to the beginning of this talk. So what could cause this? What could be the, the motivation for the violence during this time period? Well, there's a couple of possibilities, and those that we can discount. The first is that unlike uh, during what LeBlanc calls the Pax Chaco, or sorry, Lexon calls the Pax Chaco, that time period where social control was a major factor and they were sending out goon squads to enact their, uh, affect their social control, one of the things that you see that's directly associated with that type of behavior, uh, punishment, social control, uh, sacrifice, and cannibalism is heavy post-mortem processing. So not only did they kill these individuals, but they tore them apart. In some cases, they consumed them, and there's evidence for cut marks and boiling on the bones. Um, in other cases, you also have evidence of social control, for example, in what archaeologists often refer to as burials of witches, in which an individual is likely accused of being a witch, and part of the process of 
not just killing and burying that individual, but dis dismembering that individual and burying them under heavy objects so they can't come back and haunt the living. Because uh, witches do that. I've also seen that in a movie. Um, so this is very different. These individuals are not post-mortem processed. They're dumped in pits, yes, in a horrible way. It very clearly screams uh, that they're desecrating the bodies, not just in the living by killing them, but they're extending it into uh, the afterlife, if you will, and desecrating uh, these individuals by burying them in these unconditional or in uh, atypical positions. Um, so there's no evidence for post-mortem processing in the Sonoran Desert. So we can rule that out. Um, there is a possibility that it results in conflict resolution. And there's some great classic examples of this. Um, uh, Phil Walker did work in, uh, on the Channel Islands. Uh, they had large-scale foraging communities in prehistory. And it appears that they had this sort of conflict res resolution, either ritualized warfare or individual conflict revolution, resolution. Uh, geez, can't say that five times fast. In individual conflict resolution whereby individuals would face off against each other. Um, and in that case, most all of the lesions on the crania are focused about the face and the front of the head because if you're face-to-face -face with someone, that's where you hit. You're not hitting the back of the head unless they turn around and run away. And so most of those lesions, as opposed to the ones from La Playa, which are located all over the cranium, most of those lesions are in the front of the cranium. What it makes me think of is the famed uh, anthropologist Napoleon Chagnon he went to work among the Yanomamo, and one of the things that he discovered was they had this type of conflict resolution within the village. And so when there was an argument, the two guys would get their clubs and they'd face off, and they would take turns hitting each other over the head until one of them passed out, uh, and that person was the loser. The person who didn't pass out, who was just standing there bloody and maimed and dazed, uh, was the winner. Sounds like a real winner, right? which is very different than what the Yanomamo also did, which was raid other villages for their foodstuffs. And they would raid the gardens in particular of these villages and end up killing someone in many cases. And so what, this is, what the evidence from uh, the Sonoran Desert seems to point to is small-scale warfare, probably between communities. In particular, likely evidence for raiding, because when raiding occurs, uh, whether they're taking captives or not, often what you see is that women and children are affected as much as males. And perhaps those women that had those cuts on their face could have been actively fighting to defend the village, not just running away. So kids, women, as well as the adults. And you saw in many cases the males also had lesions on the back of their cranium, shot in the back of the neck or in the back. So they were also running away. So you can't assign any, any gender roles to behavior in this time period when it comes to violence. Um, if you're smart, you run away. If you're not, you get bashed in the front of the face. <clears throat> uh, in other cases, uh, especially arguments for captives, you often see that um, uh, differential and in particularly associated with injury recidivism, that individuals are beaten many times. Uh, those individuals tend to be captives. There's examples from the northern southwest that Deb Martin has talked about. Um, but mostly those are focused on women and that the women were the captives. They were brought to a, another village, and when they misbehaved or apparently misbehaved, they were beaten. Um, she has a really interesting theory, which I, I always like to promote, which is that uh, as a result of that, you know, these being bashed on the head is not nice, and it's akin much to what we see in, um, in American football today and CTE. And you can get behavioral changes as a result of this trauma. It's brain trauma, and that can affect your behavior. And so she argues that these women that were captives, if they're repeatedly bonked on the head, that can cause brain damage. And as a result, behaviorally, they lack impulse control, they act out, and as a result, it creates this positive feedback cycle. It's a really interesting theory. Uh, but again, in the case of La Playa and the broader early agricultural period, we just don't quite see the evidence for it. I think everybody's, uh, everybody's involved, and it's probably raiding between villages. Um, the problem is, is that when you start doing this, and the, the example of the Yanomamo and Napoleon Chagnon, uh, he argues that it creates these cycles of revenge. And uh, that's one of the things that I was concerned with looking at because most people look for resource stress as an, exam as an explanatory model. And like I said, we don't have any evidence for resource stress during this time period. Um, and so the possible, the, the locations of sites might be one because there's certain places along the rivers that are best suited for agricultural land or, or setting up these agricultural villages. So that's one possibility. Uh, so you could be fighting for arable land. That's 
one potential explanation. But one of the things that I've argued is that regardless of what starts the cycle, what continues it is revenge. And so one of the things that we looked at is um, ethnographic examples of uh, societies with warfare or lacking warfare. And so uh, within that, uh, this cross-cultural sample, what they refer to as internal warfare are between villages within an area. So, you know, related villages or related communities, not one area versus another area. So not like the Sonoran Desert versus the Plateau people, uh, but effectively what we'd be looking at in the early agricultural period. And one of the things they found was that in those societies that experienced frequent internal warfare, one of the things that we see is that they also had prescriptions for revenge, whereby you can see how you can create this positive feedback cycle like the Hatfields and the McCoys. You kill one of mine, I'm going to come back and kill one of yours. And this is the same kind of thing that, was, that Chagnon uh, observed among the Yanomamo as well. And there's several other societies that have documented, ethnographers have documented this type of behavior. And of course, the inverse is true. So those societies that rarely or uh, never or rarely experience internal warfare, of course, there were no prescriptive uh, uh, ideas or rules for revenge. And in fact, in those cases, revenge was largely forbidden. So revenge is a major, or potentially could be a major motivating factor in creating these cycles that could have lasted for the entire duration of the early agricultural period. Which is the, my last caveat. Of course, we're talking about a very small sample and a very long time period. Um, not all the burials are dated, but one of the things that we can say is that those burials that are dated spread throughout the entire early agricultural period. So there's at no point in which we can say that violence was absent during that time period until after that when you get the precursors of what will become Hohokam and possibly that larger scale organization that eventually puts the social control mechanism into place, puts the kibosh on violence between or within these communities. So what can we say about what we lear learned today? Um, foraging related injuries, of course, are common throughout the early agricultural period. Anybody can you know, fall off a rock and hurt themselves. Um, but there is clear evidence for violence present during this time period, both in the skeletal remains as well as the archaeological context as well. And what I've referred to in other cases is body disposals. I obviously recycled this slide. Um, it's possible that violence was likely the result of raiding between communities, either for the materials that they had or potentially for captives, for wives. That's another possibility. And that it's also possible that this created a revenge cycle, that individuals being killed or being attacked want to revisit that upon the community that attacked them or killed their loved one. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, uh, comments, criticisms, <laughs> fashion advice. Thank you, Jim. Just to kick things off, would you, I mean, Dealing with human remains is a sensitive issue, and things are different in Mexico than they are in the, in the U.S. And would you give us a little bit of a bigger context of the site of La Playa, the erosional landscape, and how that uh, La Playa uh, project has been um, developed down in Mexico? Sure. Most of the thing, and maybe contrast it with the samples that you have from the Tucson Basin and the kinds of uh, projects that cause those to be excavated. Sure, and I should have explained from the beginning, my, the background of my slide here is an aerial photograph of the site of La Playa. And one of the defining characteristics is extensive erosion. This is actually a badlands landscape. Um, they started ranching the site um, of just about 1900, so this is just over 100 years of uh, cattle denuding the site, and as a result, it began to wash away. And so I would, I would estimate that at least a quarter maybe half of the site has completely eroded away and washed down the Magdalena River to the Sea of Cortez. So this is what I like to call Mexican preservation archaeology because in this case, the site's eroding and it's washing away. And if we don't go out and record, document, and preserve the objects that are eroding away, it'll be gone forever. And so that was the project was started uh, by colleagues of mine in Mexico, uh, now in Mexico, John Carpenter and Lisa Villalpando, as a, sort of a rescue project, documenting what was being eroded. And that started in 96, so it's been 22 years now that the project's been going. And I joined it in 98. Um, 
And yes, there is a major difference, especially when dealing with human remains and associated funerary objects in Mexico versus the United States. Um, and that is, in Mexico, all of the archaeology, including human remains, is considered part of the national cultural patrimony. It belongs to the people of Mexico. And in many cases, you also don't have the colonial dichotomy that you see in the United States between the dominant society and native communities. Instead, you know, you could argue everybody's part native in Mexico, part of the mestizaje of the society or the culture as it, as it expanded. Um, so it's different in that sense of the ownership of it, whereas in this case, and I will say my primary job at the museum is uh, facilitating repatriation, documenting human remains, native human remains, and returning them to the native communities that request them. And this is a critical thing that we do because they were excavated and torn out of the ground from uh, communities that, or, or areas that, of course, are the descendants of modern living uh, native communities. And they need to have or deserve to have their say in what happens to the remains of their ancestors. So, yeah, it is difficult working back and forth across the border. Uh, the one thing that I will say is that as a result of the work at La Playa and the nature of it eroding out, this is very different because we're basically recovering what's eroding out. God's the excavator, if you will. He's the one doing the work. We just kind of collect it. Uh, whereas the projects that have been taken place in Tucson, why we know so much about this time period in Tucson, have been controlled archaeological excavations where you go from actually not even knowing in many cases that there's a site under the ground to peeling back the layers to expose that site. There's no way. There are canal systems at La Playa, just like there were at Las Capas that I showed you that slide from. In fact, the graphic I designed based on the canal systems at La Playa, but you can't see them on the surface. You can't scrape it back because it's been all eroded out. So that's a major difference. So the, the funny thing is we know a lot about this time period because of these two very different types of approaches to archaeology. So I want to let the audience uh, have some questions here. So if you uh, will raise your hand, um, I will repeat the question so that we definitely get it onto the, I think maybe we're getting a Facebook question here. <laughs> Thank you for we'll joining let, us on uh, Facebook. Yeah, we've had like 35 or so people at any one time on Facebook, so that's fun. Great. Um, this is from Deborah Martin, who I think <laughs> you might know. Yeah, who I mentioned. She's okay. probably going to yell at me for talking. <laughs> no, no, no. Theory. She's being kind. She <laughs> says, I am wondering how it was determined that all the postcranial fractures and trauma were due to nonviolent means. Broken ribs are often from interpersonal conflict as well as accidental falls. But how would one determine causation in the cause of ribs, wrists, the long bone, bones with fractures, etc.? cetera? Um, you know, I felt like it. I just kind of separated them out and said, these are trauma, these are not. No, I'm joking. Actually, it, I was being cautious. And so um, I can't be sure in many of these cases. Uh, sometimes the type of fracture, obviously, and Deb knows this, obviously the type of fracture can be telling, but in many cases if preservation isn't as good as we'd like it to be, it's a little problematic. So in these cases, what I'd like to say is that my numbers are conservative and that we only counted those, like I said, the postcranial trauma we only counted those perifractures because, and in, again, those could potentially be nonviolent uh, fractures, but those were the ones that were a lot more likely to be traumatic or violent uh, trauma. And so we were being safe on the side of saying, well, these fractures could be, but we didn't want to inflate our numbers artificially. So that's how. And there are some cases, again, when you get down to the individual case level, like I said, a couple of these individuals that were... Um, uh, shot to death effectively and buried had postcranial breaks. And we really think that that was evidence of those individuals being either stuffed in or, or, uh, or bashed effectively on their limbs before they were dumped in that, in that pit. So it was really about conservative estimates more than anything. Thanks for tuning in, Deb. We'll be right over and I'll let you get... You're close enough, I can hand it to you. Thank you. I have two questions about timing. The first question has to do with La Playa. What is the time period for, for people living at that particular location? It's all between about two and 4,000 years old. So, that again, that same time period, which is the early agricultural period. What's interesting, what I didn't mention, is that um, after this time period, people start to cremate their dead. And so we've got a really good gauge of being able to say, 
uh, whether we radiocarbon date the context or the burials themselves, to say that after a certain period, we're getting less and less inhumations. And so it's usually relatively safe to be able to say that most of those inhumations date to that time period. And that's where most of the dates come from, from the site as well. We have a few later dates, but they're rare because of the erosion. It appears that those upper layers were all eroded off. And so what's left over is the early agricultural component. And my second question in terms of timing is uh, the origin of corn. Where did that occur and how long ago did it, did it happen? So maize was originally domesticated in uh, Mexico, probably on the, west, uh, the western coast of Mexico. And the dates vary, but anyway, between six to 8,000 years ago, more or less. Uh, and then it quickly spreads up north. Actually, what's really interesting about how corn spreads is that we get corn uh, spreading into the southwest United States, into the desert west here, at the same time that we get it spreading into the deserts of the western coast of South America. So it spreads in both directions very quickly across numerous diverse cultures. So it really is, again, a very, it's an amazing plant. Way up here. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm wondering, you've mentioned uh, projectile points and tips, stuck in bone, um, darts, uh, I think you've mentioned, but were there also arrows, spears? How, what, what sort of weapons were, were used? Yeah, and uh, the experts in the audience, but I'll give my version of it, which is horribly incorrect. No, um, uh, yes, this is actually a time period where we see a transition, likely, in, uh, from spear thrower or darts to the bow and arrow. Uh, and it's sort of towards the end of this time period. Um, the problem is both types that we could potentially argue could be darts versus arrow points were found in bodies. Um, I'd like to make the argument, and I'm sure I can be corrected, that most of these are related to dart injuries. Um, so whether they were using spear throwers, which is likely the case, um, or handheld darts as well, that's another possibility. But most of them are points that appear to be mostly associated with, with darts before. or And the important thing is the transition of bow and arrow isn't a complete transition. They still continue to use spear throwers well after the bow and arrow is introduced into the region. So that doesn't negate the possibility that it was dart versus bow and arrow. Um, I have another um, two sort of connected questions coming out of um, Facebook. We gave Bill a break real quick, <laughs> run out to get a beer. Um, <laughs> there are two questions, and I think they really are sort of connected. Um, first one was, are there links between La Playa and the Tucson Basin sites? And... Another gentleman asked a question I think that is related, which is, could the whole calm of southern Arizona migrated from the La Playa site? So they're both sort of asking about the connections between the two. Great. Well, and the, the expert that I referred to, Jane Sleva, she has a really interesting theory based on the projectile points that perhaps people migrated from La Playa into or towards the Tucson Basin. Unfortunately, the timing doesn't work out. Um, as far as people goes. We know people were at La Playa at the same time they were in the Tucson Basin. Um, but some research that one of my graduate students did looking at uh, measurements of the cranium, looking at phenotypic differences across these populations, what she was able to identify was that um, males across the entire Sonoran Desert, so from the sites in the Tucson Basin and east of the Tucson Basin and La Playa, appear to be more similar to each other than they are within individual sites. Whereas the females, the women in these communities, tended to be more similar to each other. And what she used that data or that, those results to suggest is that what we're looking at is matrilocal residence. So that males in a community must marry outside of their community and go to another community, which could actually lead to levels of hostility increasing across these communities. If you've got strange men living in your community, um, of course, that can cause tensions to rise as well. And so in this case, uh, based on the biological evidence, she suggests that there's... And it, we also know, based on some other research that we've done, uh, that males are still very mobile at this time period, um, looking at the shape of their bone and how it shapes over habitual behavior over the course of their life. It appears that men continued to move or were extremely mobile. And we know, again, at this time period, we have um, shell from the coast, uh, and resources from all over the valley. Uh, they were climbing in the mountains to get those sorts of resources and, and down. Uh, but women, again, based on the biological evidence, appear to be largely, re re not restricted, but you know, uh, uh, 
less mobile, let's say that. I don't want to say they were restricted to the village, but they were less mobile in general. And again, based on the biological evidence that we have. So if that's the case, then there's, there, I think there's probably good arguments to be made for women controlling agriculture and production and perhaps matrilineal, matrilocal households being the foundation of these communities, and then males going out to other communities. And so as a result, there's a lot of biological connectivity. And in fact, we know based on artifact styles that there is a lot of connection between the Tucson Basin and La Playa. In fact, the samples or the, the sites that are located just to the east of Tucson look a lot more different than the Tucson Basin sites from La Playa. They, they look more similar in those cases. We have a room or time for maybe a couple more questions. So I've got one over there. I'll be right there. You'll be next. I don't have a question. I just wanted to see him come across the room. <laughs> That's, I can't see. The light is in my eyes. I'll fall off the stage. No, I've got one. Um, Talk about violent <clears throat> trauma. <laughs> the uh, Chaco period you mentioned where there seemed to be a more peaceful, less violent period. You also mentioned, yeah, that's what I was referring to. I wonder what the time period was, but also it's you mentioned uh, roaming goon squads, and I wonder if, if that was a somewhat more or less violent period, if it was more of an enforced violence and more focused violence so as to control the broader violence. Right, and that's the idea is that it's, you're, you're exerting social control through violence. And so instead of broad-scale sort of warfare across the region, which is what you see pretty much before and after that time period, um, instead you see singular incidents of extreme violence. And like I said, this processing that's associated with this violence. So again, and you know, I, I'm being colloquial by saying these goon squads, but that's the potential idea is that in fact – they're enacting social control, and whether or not anyone survives it or not, right, all you need is one survivor, it doesn't matter, because the word gets out, and people know if you misbehave, you know, uh, the Chaco and goons are going to come, not just beat you up, but eat you. Yeah, o over here, yeah, I was, I was wondering, what is the population of these villages around this time, and how close in proximity are they, you know, like you say, people come in and, like, attack the others, where they... 20 miles away, 50 miles away? Were they nearby? Some of them, so these are very small villages. Like I said, you know, max between 50, maybe 100 people in some cases, but that's really big. Um, and that would sort of be towards the end of the period uh, where we see some architectural changes. But no, some of these communities are a mile apart from each other. And it really has more to do with the physiography of the region or in particular the location where the site is located. So like I said, um, one of these sites is, well, the site I referred to earlier, Las Capas, is at the confluence of the Santa Cruz and the Cañada del Oro and the Rito. And so that creates physiologically an area, physiographically, sorry, <laughs> an area where water is available towards the surface. There's sort of that confluence of flow, and they could tap into that. The other major site that's been heavily investigated is at the base of A Mountain um, and you know, the Rio Nuevo area for people from Tucson. And in that case, a mountain, which is this big geological feature, this, this volcanic feature, um, the river, the Santa Cruz River, hits it and forces water to the surface. So again, an easy place to be able to tap into the river to farm fields. Um, so those areas in particular, those individual locations, were ideal for this type of irrigation farming. Uh, in fact, at the base of A Mountain, you know, it was a swamp when the Spanish arrived. And of course, the Spanish do what they like to do and drain swamps and lakes and all sorts of water bodies. So we're going to have to close it off here. This, I think, underscores the m incredible um, new information that's been accumulating over the last several decades. And thank you, Jim, for your wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you.